Hello everyone, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. Welcome to lecture 24 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In today's course, we will be discussing about one important induced effect of earthquake, primarily related to soil, which is called as liquefaction. Generally, whenever waves generated at the source reaches to a particular site, these waves will undergo slight modifications and then finally, reach to the surface. Now, depending upon whatever medium is available onto the surface, whether it is a soil medium, whether it is foundation, whether it is superstructure, each of these mediums will interact with the wave or the disturbances which are created by the wave in the propagation medium. As a result of which there will be loading which will be created in the medium because of the propagation of various waves. How the particular medium whether it is soil, whether it is foundation, whether it is pile foundation or whether it is superstructure, how these are going to respond will decide how the, the system will remain in its position, it may undergo partial damage, it may undergo collapse. Similarly, in terms of buildings as well, if seismic loading is quite intense in terms so that the building is undergoing too much of shaking, subsequently there are lot of displacements in the building, cracks are there in the building, the building will undergo complete collapse as well. So, it is basically how a particular building or a structure or a soil medium is going to respond due to earthquake loading condition that will define the, the process how the earthquake loading is actually contributing to the existing structure, existing soil. As we discussed in seismic hazard analysis that when uh, waves reach to a particular site, there are different ways in which the interaction of the wave with the medium will come into light. That means, primary example is excessive ground shaking. The seismic waves when being modified because of local soil and reaching onto the ground surface, these seismic wave will cause too much of ground shaking even in the foundation, the superstructure. So, that is one kind of induced effects. It is actually not the effect because of the seismic wave, but the resultant of how the system available at a particular site is going to respond to the seismic waves. Similarly, you can have landslides, again there is a medium, there is a structure which is going to respond to the seismic waves which are actually being applied to that particular medium. We will discuss how different kinds of landslide may happen, but each of these landslides are basically the response of your soil, response of your structure, response of your rock which are actually the part of your structure corresponding to the earthquake loading condition. If the medium is quite intact, it is, in, it is having enough strength, certainly the medium will not undergo any kind of failure. You can say there was no landslide, the material was safe against landslide occurrence. Similarly, if the ground shaking at the surface is lower, you can say the induced effect due to ground shaking will be significantly low. In similar manner, another induced effect is, is called as liquefaction. As the name suggests, it is the phenomena in which by virtue of earthquake loading which will be applied to the soil medium and bringing into account because there are soil medium in this pore spaces which are available in the soil medium there will be water present in the medium. So, what happens when earthquake loading is applied to the soil medium which is also having water in the pores. In general during static condition when you apply the load the pore water which will come out through the pores reach to the drainage path and then it will dissipate because in static loading condition the load will also take time to apply it and then subsequently the pore water will also get time to dissipate. However, in case of earthquake loading condition the scenario significantly changes that means, you are applying some loading we have already discussed what is the rate at which what is the uh, velocity at which the waves are passing through a particular medium. 
that clearly gives an indication what is the duration for which the earthquake loading will be applied in a particular medium. It will be some fraction of seconds. So, now consider again a saturated medium primarily in sandy medium because in sandy medium only generally during static condition the time is significantly larger the permeability of the medium is also facilitating dissipation of pore pressure with respect to loading. However, in the same sandy medium whenever there is earthquake loading or waves which are passing through a particular medium if we recall the propagation of wave through a particular medium will cause particle oscillation. So, now there is wave which is passing through a particular medium causing some kind of disturbance in the particle which will actually induce pore water pressure keeping that the duration of such loading the duration for which the seismic wave is actually inducing displacements in the particle through which it is passing it is of the range of some fraction of seconds that fraction of second may not be enough for pore water pressure to dissipate. So, what will happen the pore water pressure which was the pore water which was actually building a pressure inside the soil medium that will actually try to push because there is no drainage path there is no enough time for this pore water to reach to the drainage path and get dissipated within that small duration of time. So, what will happen this pore water which is now under tremendous pressure because of seismic loading condition will start pushing the particles as a result or the end effect of seismic loading on soil medium primarily cohesionless soil medium. We will see that during static condition a ground which was significantly labeled it was providing enough strength to superstructure or any other kind of loading whether it was dead load live load it was offering significant resistance because even though there was building up of pore water pressure significant time was there for that pore pressure to get dissipate. However, in case of earthquake loading the dissipation cannot happen because the rate of loading is so fast that even considering very high permeability the time which requires for dissipation is not available in the medium. As a result as I mentioned this built up of pore water building up uh, excess pore pressure which is building up within the pore uh, pores actually will try to push soil particles. So, initially before earthquake loading came into picture thus the medium was quite stable it was offering resistance whether you can say it was supporting a building or it was supporting uh, may be uh, wind turbine or it may be supporting a car parked on the particular soil medium. So, all these structures or all these kinds of loading were more or less in stable condition. Suddenly an earthquake loading is applied to that particular soil. If there is a building consider there is a building and the foundation of that building experiences building up of pore water pressure. As a result of this uh, excess pore pressure the particles have now been pushed away from each other. So, initially the particles were in relatively confined position now have actually moved to quite loose state. So, if you look at that particular soil it will almost look like a liquid. So, liquid is basically representing a phenomena in which the soil which was otherwise during static condition was providing sufficient strength the medium itself or the superstructure itself was significantly in stable condition, but because now the soil has undergone liquefied or the soil has undergone completely into state of liquid any kind of superstructure which is actually located. So, consider there was a building over here and corresponding to this particular building there were some foundations which were actually gaining resistance from the soil whether you say in terms of settlement you say in terms of bearing capacity, but sufficient resistance was there from the soil medium. Now, consider this was during stable condition during 
static condition same soil soil remains same but now you have applied additional loading because of seismic loading you have applied as a result of this particular seismic loading there was building up of pore water pressure when this pore water pressure built up there was development of excess pore pressure within this particular medium so soil particles which were very close now will start moving away from each other this particular medium same medium during dynamic loading has actually turned the medium into liquid state liquid state means soil is very low very high interparticular space and in between those particle which are quite uh, I mean which are separated by significant distance is only water is there. So, that is almost like a liquid or you can say like it is it is almost kind of slurry which has capability of flowing. Now, initially in static condition the material was offering significant strength. Suddenly you can consider this material which was otherwise very stiff has been replaced by another material which is almost like a liquid. In such a case what will happen to the foundation, what will happen to the building? Because the foundation medium is not able to offer resistance which otherwise it was offering. Suddenly you will see if it is happening all throughout you may see uniform settlement, if it is happening at one side rather in comparison to the other side you may see the building has undergone tilting or there is sign of uneven settlement. If it is happening throughout the building uniformly you may see too much of total settlement. The building itself has sunk into the ground maybe half a story, one story, maybe less than that, maybe more than that. So, that means not because of the, the, the strength of the building, but because of loss of strength in the subsurface medium the superstructure has undergone failure. Now, same thing we can also understand if there is wind turbine above it that will also undergo differential settlement of too much of total settlement. If there is a parking space, you parked a vehicle in the parking area, suddenly there was an earthquake loading. As a result of this earthquake loading, the, 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 the soil which was available in the parking has actually turned into liquid. You parked your vehicle over that, what will happen to that particular, that car that will simply sink into the ground. So, many a times if you search many a time you will see that part particular parking area turned into liquid as a result of which whatever parks uh, uh, vehicles were parked those have actually sunk into the ground. Many a time you will see because of uh, again because of excessive uh, uh, building up of pore water pressure there will be loss of material or the material turned into liquid at certain depth below the pavement suddenly you will see after a particular earthquake loading you will see some significant portion of pavement has shown wider cracks or has actually sunk into the ground. So, again ground subsidence is another way in which induced effects of earthquake can be visualized at the site. So, liquefaction because I mentioned not only related to open area, but many a times because of buildings, because of parking space, may, uh, uh, because of uh, other utilities which are actually supported by the ground and in this particular case ground itself is losing the strength and subsequently they will not be significant support from the ground leading to failure. That is why it is important to understand the liquefaction potential of a particular site. When we say about liquefaction potential that means we are interested to know how much potential the site is having in order to undergo liquefaction. If we are able to find out the liquefaction potential of a particular site and based on our assessment we found that the site is sufficient, it is sufficiently safe against liquefaction that means you need not worry about future earthquake loading in during which the chances that the soil may undergo liquefaction is very less. On the contrary there are sites which even if you find 
that the, there are the, the sites are having very high potential to undergo liquefaction. So, you need not wait for actual earthquake loading to be induced at a particular site and under, undergo failure in terms of liquefaction, ground subsidence, total or differential settlement. What we will do? If we have found out that the site is potential to undergo liquefaction, we will take that particular site, treat that particular ground, whether you can go with ground improvement techniques or there are other ways in which you can actually enhance the in situ strength of the soil such that when the actual earthquake loading is applied onto the soil medium, the soil medium will be having sufficient strength in order to in comparison to the stresses which will be actually mobilized in the soil during earthquake loading condition. So, that will ensure that even though the soil initially was very soft, but by means of treating the particular soil, we have actually enhanced the in situ strength of the soil. Once the in situ strength of the soil has been enhanced, you can actually go for construction of superstructure, ensuring that during a particular earthquake loading, actually this particular soil medium will not undergo liquefaction. So, there will not be any kind of failure which otherwise would have happened on that particular soil medium because of liquefaction phenomena. So, in today's class, we will be discussing about primarily we will be discussing about how to quantify the liquefaction potential of a particular site. Further, there are different methods in which the liquefaction potential of a particular site can be found. As far as this particular lecture is concerned and uh, uh, this particular course is concerned, we will be focusing more on stress based approach like how one can find out the liquefaction potential of a particular site. So, let us look further into the topic. So, liquefaction as I mentioned as per Sladen et al 1985, liquefaction is defined as a phenomena wherein a mass of soil loses a significant portion. Please note that the mass of the soil which was actually offering resistance to overcoming load, but during earthquake loading condition it has actually lost significant portion of its shear strength. Now, when shear strength is not there, how the soil is going to face the shear stresses which are otherwise going to stress, uh, which are going to be mobilized in the soil medium due to overcoming load. So, it is basically the phenomena in which the soil medium or the mass of the soil which we are targeting to, it actually loses a significant portion of its shear strength when subjected to monotonic loading when subjected to cyclic loading, when subjected to shocks. So, need not be only earthquake loading condition, may be many a time because of construction activities generating significant uh, amount of vibrations, amplitude as well as frequency content may also cause building up of pore water pressure similar to liquefaction. During monotonic loading also many a times, if you are driving a pile again this kind of situation where building up of excess pore pressure may come can be faced. So, it is it is more or less related to monotonic or cyclic loading condition. Cyclic loading as I mentioned during earthquake loading condition there will be cyclic loading or the nature of the loading will be cyclic. How much cyclic loading as we discussed in uh, uh, ground motion characteristics of the vibration we can find out also what is the frequency content of harmonic motion what is the duration of motion, bracketed duration, significant duration all those things we can find out. So, such a motion which is actually showing cyclic nature whether it is related to earthquake or any other nature many a times because of uh, blasting which is happening for different purposes those can also cause state of liquefaction in the soil medium, but certainly that will depend on how much loading has actually been applied to the soil medium that loading and in situ properties of the soil medium collectively will decide whether the soil will undergo liquefaction or it will not undergo liquefaction. Okay. So, so, the soil has lost significant portion of shear strength and after losing that strength, it is almost flowing in a manner resembling a liquid. Now, this process that the soil has turned from uh, uh, stable to almost liquid form like initially it was in solid state, but because of building up of pore water pressure pushing the particles away from each other now it is turned into liquid state 
how long this liquid state will continue till the time shear stress is acting on the material because of external loading conditions or subsequently the building up the built up pore water pressure in the soil medium or in the soil pores it is getting dissipated. Because the phenomena of liquefaction started because of uh, uh, resulting in building up of pore water pressure. So, as far as the excess pore pressure which actually has built up in the soil medium unless that gets dissipated that gets over whatever excess pore pressure was generated it will reach to some drainage path it will dissipate. Once it is dissipated then you will say the phenomena of liquefaction is complete. Now, there is no more continuation of the phenomena of liquefaction. So, it is not like once the liquefaction has happened the soil will be in continuous state of flow that will not happen. So, the, the state of flow will only continue till the moment the dissipation of pore pressure is not complete. Once the dissipation of pore pressure is complete there will not be further movement whether you say in terms of large displacement whether in terms of flow of material that will completely arrest at the moment the dissipation of pore pressure is complete. So, acting on the soil medium such that the external loading condition or the loading because of earthquake has actually been removed. So, in such a case what will happen the shear stress acting on the material layer are also reduced as low as the shear strength of the soil which is available in its in situ condition. So, initially you applied some loading condition as a result of which there was building up of pore water pressure pushing the soil particles. The pore water excess pore pressure built up will start dissipating at the same time there will be reduction in the earthquake loading condition. So, dissipation of pore water pressure reduction in the earthquake loading condition subsequently will end the, the, the phenomena of liquefaction at a particular site and then the soil will be left with some in situ strength of liquefied soil. Now, there are two ways in which liquefaction generally happens at a particular site. If you say in terms of triggering mechanism one is flow liquefaction as the uh, definition suggests here. The flow liquefaction occurs when the shear stress required for static equilibrium. So, how much shear stress is required for static equilibrium is greater than the in situ shear strength of the soil in its liquefied state. Soil has undergone liquefaction whatever shear stress you are applying from the external loading condition actually it is more than the in situ shear strength of the soil. As a result what will happen the soil keeps on undergoing failure resulting in large deformation. So, such kind of failures where the in situ shear strength is less than the shear stress applied because of external loading condition you call it as flow liquefaction. Second phenomena because of uh, uh, again from liquefaction is cyclic mobility. So, it is generally related to the confinement. So, where you see it occurs when the static shear stress is less than the shear strength of the soil in liquefied state. So, even though there is uh, the shear stress is less than the strength of the soil in liquefied state, but because of loss of confinement again you will see there is development of cyclic mobility in the medium. Again this cyclic mobility will also result in large permanent deformations. So, these are actually the signature which one see at a site and which has undergone liquefaction in order to see what characteristics the liquefaction phenomena has triggered at a particular site. And then subsequently there are ways in which one can uh, even say whether it was cyclic mobility or flow liquefaction in which uh, like how, how the mechanism of liquefaction is triggered at a particular site can be understood. So, cyclic mobility, mobility it can be triggered by uh, both by a cyclic as well as static loading condition. Now, there are different factors which actually govern the liquefaction potential of a particular site these include earthquake loading condition as we know that the phenomena of liquefaction or the application of external loading which actually is mobilizing shear stress in the soil medium is solely because of earthquake loading condition. Higher is earthquake loading condition you can say higher development of development of higher shear stresses will be happening in the soil medium. Same with respect to the degradation in the material properties. So, 
even there is reduction uh, uh, the amplitude of loading is significantly low, but the duration is more then again also you can see there is degradation in the material properties as we see in the dynamic soil properties. So, again that will also control whether the soil will undergo liquefaction or not. Third one is ground water table as I mentioned the entire process of liquefaction is happening because of building up of pore water pressure. So, if the ground water table is at significant depth there will not be development of pore water pressure or excess pore pressure will not be there then that will not trigger liquefaction phenomena. Soil type again if the soil is having generally cohesionless soil are uh, mentioned about uh, potentially liquefiable. If you talk about plastic low to medium plastic soils are also there those basically offer resistance to liquefaction. So, depending upon which is uh, which type of soil is available at a particular site can also give an indication about whether if the suitable earthquake loading conditions are uh, uh, generated at a particular site whether the soil will undergo liquefaction or not primarily because of its type. Then relative density, so certainly medium which are having very low, low relative density or soft so, uh, type of medium that means the medium initial uh, resistance was already significantly low over that you have applied excess pore pressure development then certainly those kinds of material will undergo liquefaction much earlier or and much easier than the soil where relative density was significantly high. Particle size distribution, so usually if large range of particles are present in the medium then the then uh, bigger pores will be occupied by smaller particles. So, there will be some particles which are actually available in the pore spaces in comparison to the soil medium which are having same sort of soil particles. So, there the chances of having voids will be more in comparison to like size of the voids will be more. So, you can say the particles where uh, same size of soil are present soil where same size of particles are present will, uh, will be more prone to liquefaction than where different size particles are present in the soil medium. Placement condition depositional environment also decide where the soil is present what are the surrounding condition that will also define whether the soil is potential to undergo liquefaction or not. Drainage condition, if drainage condition is sufficiently enough then there will be ease to undergo dissipation of pore water pressure. If that is not there then development of excess pore pressure will be dominating. Same with respect to confining pressure, if confining pressure is there that will also provide uh, uh, resistance to liquefaction because as you are going deeper and deeper with increase in confinement you will see the liquefaction potential of the same soil even though the properties of the soil medium remain same, but because of confinement there will be reduction in the potential to undergo liquefaction. Particle shape generally rounded particles they, they will not have such good contact with respect to adjacent particles. So, that they can be separated very easily in comparison to elongated particles or where the particles can get interlocked with respect to the neighboring particles. Aging and cementation generally when you leave a particle because of precipitation of different salts in the medium there will be some kind of cementation happening between the particles as a result it is not only the particle, but particle particle contact what is the nature of this particular cementation which generally comes with aging. So, you will see some particle which is freshly deposited and some particle which are there for quite some time. So, generally older particle will because of cementation and aging effect will be able to offer more resistance to building up of pore water pressure and its dissipation with comparison to younger deposits. Historical environment again it has been seen that some sites which have already undergone liquefaction and after liquefaction have now deposited to relatively denser medium. Then for such soil to un again undergo liquefaction under same loading condition will be relatively less because now the medium has undergone to relatively denser state. Building load again what kind of loading condition is also coming on to this from the superstructure what surcharge you have applied that will also define what is the uh, uh, potential of that particular site to undergo liquefaction. So, what are the consequences why one is interested to uh, know whether the site is potential to undergo liquefaction because when liquefaction occurs at a particular site there are consequences which can be witnessed easily 
some of the consequences which can be witnessed during uh, earthquake loading condition primarily when liquefaction has occurred include settlement. As I mentioned settlement is primarily important because the soil has undergone because of dissipation of pore water pressure and before this dissipation has occurred thus because of building up of pore water pressure the particle were pushed away from each other. So, there were lot of voids where particles were not there. When the pore pressure dissipation is over the particle were in very loose state and then they will start settling. So, there will be settlement lateral spread there are lot of lateral spread as a result because there was development of pore water pressure when this excess pore pressure started moving towards the drainage surface that also took soil particles with it. So, you will see later, lot of lateral uh, spread lateral flows also as uh, consequence of liquefaction occurrence loss of support if you are talking about foundations like pile foundation is there or shallow foundation is there and all the medium which was again supporting the foundation from all around that medium has actually been washed away. So, certainly there will be loss of support same you can see in terms of bridge piers also. So, there will be lot of if, if liquefaction has occurred then you will see the, the, the there is no support from laterally or from beneath as a result there will be settlement there will be failure there will be tilting in the piers loss of lateral support as I mentioned even in terms of abutments also you will see there was loss of lateral support as a result it will lead to failure. So, many many things are there which are basically the consequences one can witness in a particular site which has undergone liquefaction due to earthquake loading condition primarily otherwise we have also seen there are sites which can undergo uh, liquefaction due to monotonic loading condition. Now, there are uh, different criteria based on which one can one need not go for uh, detailed investigation, but even the soil type itself moisture content properties of the soil itself will give you a fair idea about whether the soil is having susceptibility. So, that means, if suitable uh, loading condition is applied to the soil that is different part, but how about the soil what what is the property of the soil whether the property of the soil are such that it can undergo liquefaction or not. So, that property will come under susceptibility what is the susceptibility that a particular site can undergo liquefaction solely depends upon uh, what is the soil properties ground water table and subsequently we can also look into historical and geological criteria. So, uh, historical criteria one can refer to historical evidences to find out zones which have undergone liquefaction and we can focus more on those locations which have undergone liquefaction in the past to understand the triggering mechanism the in situ characteristics of those particular sites. Geological criteria one can also understand what are the uh, conditions in which what are the agencies which led to the deposition what are the agencies which are uh, whether there was some cementation effect in that particular location or not. So, deposition hydrological environmental and relative age of the soil deposit will also be studied in terms of geological criteria in order to understand the susceptibility of a particular site to liquefaction. Next is compositional criteria what is the composition of in situ soil available at a particular site. So, Chinese criteria that was given by uh, Wang 1979 you can see here. So, there is uh, plot liquid limit on y axis and saturated moisture content on x axis and then you can see potentially liquefied soil potentially non liquefiable sites primarily based on the content of particle which are less than 0 0.005 mm. So, if the content of particle less than 0 0.005 mm is less than 20 percent which was mentioned as clay fraction if it is less than 20 percent and the plasticity index of the soil is less than 13 then you can call the particular soil is potentially liquefiable. And the, 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 the region which can distinguish between potentially liquefied and non liquefied also can be plotted using 0.87 times liquid limit of the soil and then liquid limit equals to 33.5 percent as shown in the first figure. In addition, if the uh, natural moisture content of the soil is 0.87 times the liquid limit of the soil or when the liquid limit of the soil is greater than 33 percent you can call that the soil is potentially liquefiable uh, non liquefiable. 
If the clear fraction is more than 20 percent, again referring to the particle size which is given for potential liquefied site, uh, that is 0 0.005 mm, you can call the soil is potentially non-liquefied. Or when the plasticity index is greater than 13, you can call that the soil is potentially non-liquefied. Similarly, Andrews and Martin in 2000 proposed another criteria where you can say if the clay fraction were primarily mentioned about 0 0.002 mm, that clay fraction is less than 10 percent and the liquid limit of the soil is less than 32 percent, such soil you can call it as potentially liquefiable. Non-liquefiable sites if the liquid limit is greater than 32 percent and the clay fraction is greater than 10 percent, you can call that based on the compositional criteria of the soil and moisture content, the soil is it may be liquefied or non liquefied if it is matching with the criteria mentioned on the screen. Then uh, Suchida in 1970 also proposed the range in which potentially liquefiable sites are present as can be seen in the, uh, uh, the, the third figure that this gives this plot gives lower bound and upper bound particle size distribution curve. So, if you collect sample from a particular site, obtain the grain size distribution of that sample, try to put over here, if that grain size distribution is falling between the lower range and the upper range, you can say in case favorable loading conditions are given, the soil compositionally has the uh, possibility to undergo liquefaction or there is susceptibility to undergo liquefaction if favorable loading conditions are given. So, there are three criteria based on which uh, 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 which I mentioned over here based on which one can identify whether uh, soil which is available in situ whether it is potential to undergo liquefaction. Uh, again state criteria based on the initial state of the soil and how the initial state of the soil and subsequently the loading which will be applied whether monotonic loading or cyclic loading, one can again bring into account the effective stress path and then see whether the soil is reaching to its uh, critical state and what is the path it is taking and subsequently we can decide whether it is undergoing flow liquefaction or uh, cyclic mobility, those we will discuss in uh, coming lectures. Again, there are different ways in which one can evaluate the liquefaction potential. As I mentioned in the beginning, there are different ways, but we will be focusing more on cyclic stress approach. So, different ways which one can refer to are cyclic stress approach, cyclic strain approach mostly uh, followed, then we have energy dissipation approach, we have effective stress response based approach and then probabilistic liquefaction also is there where you can find out considering different properties of the soil, what is the probability that it can undergo liquefaction or not. Okay, so further, we will continue with respect to the cyclic stress approach. Now, in cyclic stress approach, the main objective is to compare based on the in situ characteristics of the soil, how much is the cyclic resistance soil can offer depending on the contrary, depending upon the loading condition, which you can say may be primarily because of most likely what magnitude of the earthquake and what uh, peak ground acceleration the surface will be experiencing during a particular earthquake. These two properties will help you in understanding how much is the cyclic loading or cyclic stress, which will be actually mobilized in the soil because of a particular earthquake loading. So, comparing the stress which are because of earthquake loading condition and resistance which is because of in situ soil condition, we can understand whether for this particular stress condition and this particular resistance soil is offering whether the soil will undergo liquefaction or it will not. So, earthquake loading condition, earthquake induced loading in terms of cyclic shear stress. As we mentioned, there will be cyclic loading which are happening because of earthquake. In order to find out the liquefaction, so this nature of cyclic loading is compared with the resistance which soil is going to offer in terms of cyclic stress ratio. Cyclic stress ratio means whatever loading or cyclic shear stress which is being mobilized because of a particular earthquake loading condition in the soil medium that will be compared with respect to the resistance the soil is offered. And depending upon the relative values of these two parameters resistance and the 
loading condition, one can decide whether the soil is safe against liquefaction, whether the soil will undergo liquefaction and subsequently it can be estimated. Now, here one uh, observation when we talk about cyclic loading condition, primarily when we are dealing with the laboratory tests like cyclic triaxial tests, we will be subjecting that sample with respect to cyclic loading with controlled amplitude and frequency content. In earthquake loading condition, because it is random in nature, the amplitude frequency content it is not same. So, it will be very difficult to find out what average frequency content, what average peak ground acceleration one should take into account in order to account for the pore pressure which will be generated due to actual earthquake loading condition. So, bringing those uncertainty into account in cyclic stress approach, we will take another parameter which is called as 0 0.65. This 0 0.65 has been proposed such that the maximum stress which are generating, maximum shear stress which are actually generating because of earthquake loading condition can be approximated equals to 0 0.65 times the stress loading, uh, the shear stresses which will be mobilized in the soil medium corresponding to cyclic loading condition. Now, both of these will be used. So, this point, uh, 0.65 is the conversion factor which will help in converting the irregular time histories because of external uh, actual earthquake loading to equivalent series of uniform stress cycles, uniform stress cycles. So, whatever loading actually the earthquake loading has induced in the soil. So, you will see for some particular duration there will be peak amplitude, but other than that particular duration the amplitude of the vibration will be significantly lower. So, how to account for this peak as well as not the entire duration of the loading, the only the peak value was there. So, one, ha one has come up with C and Idris came up with this particular uh, correlation that cyclic stress ratio can be correlated with respect to the maximum shear stress divided by the effective overburden pressure multiplied by a function that is called as conversion factor from maximum to average cyclic loading maximum during earthquake loading, average during cyclic loading or uniform number of cycles. So, 0 0.65 was the factor which was given. So, cyclic stress ratio CSR is cyclic stress ratio, it is given as the ratio of tau cyclic, how much cyclic loading is leading to cyclic shear stress divided by effective overburden pressure. Now, this cyclic will be having uniform cycles of loading, so loading then unloading, loading, unloading those kinds of cycles will be there. So, when I say unloading it is going initially it was like 2 motion then it will come to fro motion. So, 2 and fro motion with respect to mean position. So, that will rep represent cyclic loading condition. Now, in this particular case though it is cyclic it is also uniform in nature. So, that is why it is more, more mentioned as uniform stress cycle. So, this is resembling uniform stress cycle and this is resembling one characteristic of peak shear stress which was which was mobilized in the soil medium due to actual earthquake loading. So, using this particular factor 0 0.65 times tau max we, we multiplied with respect to maximum shear stress by 0 0.65. Now, whatever we are getting it is cyclic value which is representing the uniform cyclic uh, loading cycles in the soil medium. So, this conversion factor proposed for the multiplication function of 0.65 which was proposed is used to convert as per Seed and Idris 1967, it used to convert the irregular time histories of recorded ground motions to equivalent cyclic loading such that increase in pore water pressure. So, there is cyclic loading also which is leading to building up of pore water pressure and then irregular loading also which is triggering to building up of pore water pressure. By using this conversion factor of 0.65 or multiplication function of 0.65, in both cases whether you are talking about cyclic loading condition or you are talking about irregular ground motions, both are maintaining the development of pore water pressure uniformly. So, tau cyclic is used from tau max or 
A max maximum shear stress, uh, maximum ground motion, ground acceleration or generally referred as peak ground acceleration, which is the peak value of your acceleration time history record. Take that value, which is also a representation of maximum shear stress mobilized in the soil during actual earthquake loading condition, multiply it with respect to 0 0.65. So, you are actually going to get corresponding to this value, how much is the cyclic component of uniform uh, number of cycles of loading. So, cyclic stress ratio, which is actually a way of determining how much loading is expected to be delivered because of earthquake loading condition in the soil medium. So, cyclic stress ratio is 0 0.65 times, this is total stress at any depth of loading. Remember, cyclic stress ratio means liquefaction actually uh, development of pore water pressure, it is not only confined onto the ground surface, but even at deeper depth. Generally, it has been observed that even up to 20 meter depth, there are case histories where liquefaction has occurred at a particular site. So, the development of confinement, whether it is total stress or effective stress, it is varying with respect to time, uh, with respect to depth. This value we will take maximum because maximum force, maximum loading condition will be mobilized at the ground surface. So, AMX at the ground surface and then corresponding to that, how much increase or decrease will be there because of change in the confinement that will be taken care by a factor R d called as stress reduction factor. So, 0 0.65 times total stress divided by effective stress at any depth of interest. So, if you are talking, if you are interested to find out cyclic stress ratio at 2 meter depth, you will try determining the value of total and effective stress at 2 meter depth, R d value stress reduction factor again at 2 meter depth, A m x value will remain uniform throughout because it is the maximum value of peak ground acceleration or peak ground acceleration corresponding to the surface record, normalized with respect to g. So, this equation it is going to give you how much is the cyclic stress ratio generated by an earthquake, which actually generated or triggered peak ground acceleration of A m x in the on the surface. And depending upon the depth at which you are determining the value of total and effective stress, you can actually determine how much is the development of cyclic shear stress because of the same earthquake loading at different different depths. So, this way we are able to determine how much earthquake loading is actually mobilized or how much shear stresses are actually being mobilized in the soil medium at different different depth due to earthquake loading. The value of stress reduction factor is as we can see because it is representation of the confinement, you can see different researchers have given different correlations to find out what is the liquefaction potential and uh, what is the uh, stress reduction factor in a particular medium and how it is varying with respect to depth. So, z is basically a depth of the point of interest at which you are interested to find out the value of cyclic stress ratio measured with respect to the ground surface. So, if you are going from 0 to 9.15 meter, you can see that stress reduction factor can be estimated from the first equation. If it is between 9.15 to 23 meter, you can go with the second equation. If it is between 23 and 30 meter, you can go with another equation proposed by another researcher. So, using the corresponding depth at which you are interested to find out cyclic stress ratio, you can pick up the respective equation. I mean, I have mentioned here some equation, you can also search many more equations which are existing in the literature. Same way, Idris 1999 proposed this particular equation where the value of R d is a function of alpha and beta and subsequently the alpha and beta are also related with respect to the depth measured from the ground surface to the point of interest where one is interested to determine cyclic stress ratio. So, based on this you can find out the value of R d, you will be having a bore log where the density of the medium is also given, depth of ground water table is also given. So, using these two parameters density variation with respect to depth and depth of ground water table, we can determine the value of total stress as well as effective stress. R d value we have just seen how we can determine, A m x value one, one will be told or based on your hazard analysis, one can estimate how much is the surface value of peak ground acceleration 
take that value as a max, you can determine the value of cyclic stress ratio. Now, one observation here when we are talking about cyclic stress ratio, it is basically corresponding to the actual loading of earthquake which actually triggered shearing shear stress in the medium. Now, this is going to give you the loading which is actually mobilized in the soil medium. We are interested to find out the potential of a site to undergo liquefaction. So, in order to decide whether the soil is potential to undergo liquefaction or not, in addition to loading condition, there should be a mechanism through which one can determine how much is the in situ shear strength. So, that in situ shear strength one can determine based on number of methods. You can go with cyclic, simple, uh, cyclic uh, simple shear test, cyclic triaxial test. So, this is basically helping in understanding how much is the in situ strength of the soil medium. Now, there is another term which will come into picture is cyclic resistance ratio or CRR value. So, one can determine the value of CRR for any magnitude of interest and any depth of interest because resistance of the soil is actually changing because the medium itself is changing with respect to depth. So, and corresponding to a known value of confining pressure or effective stress. So, this is now you see here this equation C R R, the equation of C R R was actually proposed this particular equation based on which one can determine the value of C R R that is cyclic resistance ratio. The equation was given based on the in situ measurement of S P T values primarily corresponding to 7.5 magnitude earthquakes. So, that is why the equation of C R R it is primarily given corresponding to suffix as C R R m equals to 7.5 that means, this particular equation will give you the value of cyclic resistance ratio or measure of in situ resistance which the soil is going to offer corresponding to magnitude of 7.5. C S R was not given in terms of particular magnitude it was corresponding to actual earthquake loading here it is given corresponding to magnitude of 7.5 and also with respect to atmospheric pressure of 1 A T m. So, again here the cyclic resistance ratio is a function of this particular empirical equation which was given by Idris and Bolangar in 2010. You can see the cyclic resistance ratio is a function of one parameter which is called as N160 C S. Now, here the term N160 C S means N is S P T N value standard penetration test N value at a particular depth of interest normalized for one atmospheric pressure normalized for one atmospheric pressure corresponding to 60 percent hammer energy and corresponding to clean sand condition. One atmospheric pressure again you have standardized clean sand condition because the methodology was primarily given for clean sand condition. So, anything which is uh, deviating the soil properties with respect to clean sand condition there will be suitable. Uh, uh, empirical correlation which will be applied or corrections which will be applied. Finally, once you get the value of S P T corresponding to 60 percent hammer energy clean sand condition. So, C S is clean sand condition and N 1 1 is 1 atmospheric pressure. This value of S P T N which is modified will be put over here in this particular correlation and you can find out how much is the value of cyclic resistance ratio of the soil medium at a particular depth corresponding to one atmospheric pressure and magnitude of 7.5. Now, one question which may arise is not every time the earthquake which is going to trigger liquefaction at a particular site is equals to 7.5. So, what to do in that particular case because your C S R value cyclic stress uh, uh, ratio it is basically corresponding to actual earthquake loading but cyclic resistance ratio is so far corresponding to a magnitude of 7.5. So, in order to uh, before we will go to 7.5 you will see that N 160 it is basically the value of S P T for 1 atmospheric pressure and 60 percent hammer energy that is called as if, if that value is available to you and if the fine content which is primarily the clay content and some portion of silt if that is available if the fine content which is available in your soil medium it is less than 5 percent then you say the fine content will not have much effect on deciding the liquefaction potential of your site. You can go ahead with this particular part. Now, here 
there is no mention of CS because when the fine content is less than 5 percent, it will not have effect on controlling the liquefaction potential. So, you consider a soil which is having fine content less than 5 percent as equal to clean sand condition. So, in this particular case whether you go with N 160 CS or you go with N 160, both are going to give you the same value of cyclic resistance ratio or both are going to offer same resistance to external loading condition. So, in this particular case again you are getting the same value of CRR that is at magnitude 7.5 and burden atmospheric pressure. Determine the value if fine content is less than 5 percent, if fine content is yeah. So, the based on this you can find out N 160 CS otherwise if you are interested in general N 160 C plus delta N 160. So, delta N 160 is basically the correction to due to fine content. So, if you know the fine content you can put in this particular equation fine content is given in terms of percentage put in this particular equation you will get the value of delta N 160 that is corrected end value for uh, corresponding to fine content. So, delta N 160 you bring it here put over here this value N 160 C N 160 is already known corresponding to 60 percent hammer energy and one atmospheric pressure add up these two you will get the value of SPTN corresponding to uh, clean sand condition because now you have applied correction due to fine content. So, the equation which was given at the top was given by C. D. Tall in 1984 and then further other equations are also given. So, here you can see N 160 C. Tall address 1971 you can see over here this particular equation alpha plus beta n 160. So, this particular equation again the depending upon the value of fine content you can have the value of alpha, beta. So, three primarily divisions are there fine content less than 5 percent, fine content between 5 and 35 and if fine content is more than 35 percent then further increase in fine content whether it is 36, whether it is 46 it is not going to make much difference in terms of cyclic resistance ratio it will offer more or less same value. So, again you had some value. So, N 160 C means field measured SPTN value corrected for few measurements. As I mentioned SPTN value if you go deeper and deeper there will be effect because of confinement. Similarly, because of change in the diameter of the borehole there will be some effect on SPT value because of rod length the rod through which you are actually transferring the hammer impact to your soil sample. So, again rod length correction will be there then liner correction will be there many a times you provide liner in the borehole such that borehole should not undergo collapse. Hammer energy correction should be there overburden correction. So, these all parameters which are mentioned over here this is field measured SPTN NM which is measured at different different depths. Now, there are other parameter which can actually contribute to your SPTN value that means overburden pressure hammer energy as we mentioned there will be some hammer which will be actually transferring the impact. So, what is the efficiency of that particular hammer then borehole diameter rod length correction and liner correction. So, all these are basically the correction which will actually change the, uh, the uh, field measure SPTN value and accordingly these corrections will be applied to field measure SPT value N m you just product with this you will get the value of N 160 which was mentioned in the previous slide. So, this is the N 160 which you are going to get in addition you will have some component which is coming from fine content. So, bring that component also over here then you will have N 160 C s. So, there are different uh, 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 correlations which are given to find out the overburden correction as I mentioned on the screen by different researchers. So, one can refer to these correlations and the upper bound to this particular correlation. In addition to this there are charts tables which are given referring to which you can find out like for rod length correction depending upon what is the length of the rod or where primarily you are uh, uh, which depth particularly you are referring to you can pick up the absolute value of uh, rod length correction. Similarly, the borehole diameter correction because different places you can see different diameter of the boreholes are being used to drill a borehole while measuring SPT and value. So, again you can refer to the literature which is given over here find out the borehole diameter correction then liner presence if it is there it is not there then there are different uh, uh, 
researchers who have proposed different correlations. One can refer to these charts, get the value of Cb, Cr, Cs, refer to hammer energy, then find out how much is the hammer energy correction, overburden correction which is given in the previous slide. So, using all these corrections and field measure SPT value, one can determine the value of N160, take out the bohr log from where you can actually find out what is the fine content in the soil medium. Depending upon the percentage of fine content, you determine the value of delta N160, club N160 and delta N160 and you find out the value of N160 CS. Put this value of N160 CS in the correlations which are given for CRR, you will get the value of CRR 7.5 magnitude and 1 atmospheric pressure. There are different ways. So, so again an additional factor which will actually bring the change between 7.5 magnitude to any other magnitude at a particular site of interest which you have found out based on your hazard analysis. So, magnitude scaling factor will take this additional factor because of magnitude scaling. This particular factor is magnitude scaling factor. This magnitude scaling factor is actually going to tell you if any magnitude which is greater than uh, 7.5 that will have effect on the duration of motion. So, you will apply additional magnitude scaling factor which can be determined using the value of m. Usually, it is referred to the magnitude corresponding to which we are interested to find out the liquefaction potential. You can put over here. So, different correlations are given by different researchers. You can determine the value of magnitude scaling factors. Once the value of magnitude scaling factor is known to us, the CRR corresponding to 7.5 can be compared with respect to. So, CRR into 7.5, this is going to actually help in determining the resistance soil is going to offer corresponding to the actual magnitude and then one can compare with respect to cyclic stress ratio. So, factor of safety is equals to CRR 7.5 over CSR multiplied by magnitude scaling factor and additional factor can be there because of overburden effect and then one can determine what is the factor of safety with respect to uh, liquefaction or for a particular earthquake loading condition what is the factor of safety. So, numerical has been given over here calculate the liquefaction potential of a site and based on the bore log the in situ densities are given field measured SPT n. So, you can call it as an m value is given these two values are given then hammer energy, borehole diameter, these things are already given. So, you can refer to these and try determining fine content is also given to you. So, this is fine content or F c value directly given in terms of percentage. So, depending upon the value of fine content, we can refer whether it is less than 5 percent, 5 to 35 percent, greater than 35 percent. Pick up the correlation, determine how much is the value of delta N 160. In addition, we have been given where k sigma equals to 1, C n one can refer to Leo and Whitman 1986. So, so already some guidelines are given based on which correlation one has to use and determine the value of different coefficients and the correlation for determining the magnitude scaling factor is also mentioned over here. The correlation with respect to stress reduction factor determination is also mentioned. So, all the correlations or the value of the different correl uh, uh, corrections are also mentioned over here. What we will do? We will try determining based on the densities, field SPT measured, borehole diameter, hammer energy correction. So, hammer energy in this particular case mentioned as 70 percent hammer energy. So, we are using as 0 0.7. Then borehole diameter, rod length correction, fine content correction refer to whatever information is given. If it is not given, we can clearly mention referring to which particular literature chart, what values we are referring to then fine content corrections are also there, overburden correction already governing equation is given. So, referring to that one can find out the value of alpha beta and determine the value of C uh, uh, N 160 C s. Using this value you can determine the value of C R R. Now, magnitude is already given, correlation is also highlighted. So, one can determine the value of magnitude scaling factor. The correlation to use for stress reduction factor is also highlighted. So, you can determine the value of R D based on A max value which is given over there, one can determine the value of 
stress uh, cyclic shear stress. So, here the value of A max by G is given. So, directly using this particular value one can refer to and determine the value of cyclic stress ratio. So, using this you can see in the last column. Now, one, one observation here generally when we are determining the factor of safety for a particular site while determining the total and effective stress we refer to that the ground water table is located at the ground surface. This is primarily considered so that worst scenario earthquake worst scenario uh, with respect to liquefaction triggering can be taken into account. So, using those calculations we have determined the value of factor of safety at different different depths. Now, referring to a particular location we will call that particular location is potentially liquefiable even if one stratification between that particular location is undergoing liquefaction. So, here here we can see except one location which is having factor of safety of 1.18 all the other locations are having factor of safety very low that means all these locations are potentially liquefiable. This is boundary condition almost close to 1, but even this if any one uh, uh, layer would have shown factor of safety less than 1, we would have told that this particular site is potentially liquefiable, because even one low layer undergoes liquefaction that can goes that can lead to uh, disturbance to the entire soil column. So, we will not say that one particular layer is liquefiable or not. Once we are asked that determine the potential of liquefaction to that particular site, we will try to find out based on the minimum factor of safety throughout the length of the borehole. If it is less than 1 or generally 1.5, we call that particular site is potential to liquefaction. Okay, so, one can uh, practice these numerical and uh, that will give confidence about how to go ahead with the calculation for liquefaction potential. As I mentioned this this lecture lecture 24 is primarily to understand how to find out the liquefaction potential. What about the triggering mechanism? What is the state criteria says about liquefaction? How one can differentiate between flow liquefaction and cyclic mobility? We can discuss those in upcoming lectures. So, thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.